Hi everyone, good evening, and welcome to the Yale and U.S. College Hall. My name is Miki Concha from the class of 2025 here at Yale and U.S. College, and I will be your host for tonight's event. So before we begin, I have a couple of administrative announcements. First, please do not take any photos and videos of tonight's session. Secondly, we will be taking audience questions towards the latter half of this evening during the Q&A segment after the lecture. For those of you who are here in the hall, please raise your hands during the Q&A segment if you have a question, and our student ambassadors will hand the microphone to you. Please speak into the microphone so that our online audience can hear your question as well. For those who are participating online through Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now, please join me in welcoming Yale U.S. College President, President Joanne Roberts. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joanne Roberts, president of Yale and U.S. College, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here, both in the College Hall and those of you from around the world on Zoom. The President Speaker Series is the college's most high-profile and anticipated event every year. And every year, we welcome someone who represents the pinnacle in their field and whose impact in the world is tangible and transformative. I cannot imagine someone who embodies this description better than our speaker tonight, Linda Rotenberg. For almost three decades, Linda has worked to unleash the power of visionary founders and their ideas. As the co-founder and CEO of Endeavor, a launchpad for entrepreneurs, she has helped create thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems around the world unlocking value that has contributed to the development of emerging economies across more than 50 countries and multiple continents. Their motto is dream bigger, scale faster, pay it forward. A graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School, Linda is widely recognized for her global influence. Time Magazine called her an innovator for the 21st century. She was named one of America's best leaders by US News and World Report, and Tom Friedman dubbed her the world's mentor capitalist. That last designation gives you a sense of Linda's mission to help people figure out how to prosper and thrive in the current world order. She is a best-selling author, her crazy as a compliment, the power of zigging when everyone else zags, was an instant bestseller on the New York Times list. And her advice to all of us contains a central truth. Today, every one of us needs to be a little bit entrepreneurial. We need to take risks, or we risk being left behind. I'm excited to learn from Linda tonight, and I'm looking forward to opening the conversation for questions after her remarks. Um, but for now, um, please join me in welcoming to the stage someone who I consider a friend and an inspiration. Linda, could you please come up? Thank you. That was beautiful. Good evening, everyone, and everyone online. I am so happy to be here. And I think Joanne and I have been planning this event for many years. I first came to Yale and US back in 2019. And I have to say, I've been so impressed with everyone. Uh, the students I met uh, who toured me around were so brilliant and warm and uh, fulfilled all the, the promise of interdisciplinary thinking. I just had the pleasure of meeting with 30 uh, recent Yale and US grads on, uh, over the weekend, and they are off to do incredible things. And so to, to Joanne, to Tricia, to Ty Young and Pericles Lewis and all the people who are involved in Yale and US, this has been uh, a, such an amazing place and I've been uh, happy to be a part uh, of the, a little part of the journey. So let me share why else I'm happy to be here. Oops, can we? It's told, okay. Tybee and Eden Filer are my identical twin daughters and they are just uh, starting their second semester at Yale. They are first year students. Uh, so we are especially happy for the, for the Yale connection. Um, I went to Harvard, as you heard, <laughs> and uh, then eventually saw the light and went to Yale Law School. The problem was, 
I thought people went to Yale Law School because they didn't actually want to practice the law. And all my uh, classmates wanted to become Supreme Court justices or actually practice law. And I thought, uh-oh, I got the wrong memo. And so uh, professors at the law school took pity on me and sent me down to these clickers now. We're having clicker issues. I just click Buenos Aires. So I landed in uh, Buenos Aires in the mid-90s, and this was right after there had been a lot of economic crises and things were starting to move again. And I started thinking, well, where are the entrepreneurs that are going to show up? Because it was the mid-1990s, and back in the US, Netscape and Yahoo were just going public, and Steve Jobs had moved back to Apple, and things were starting to take off in the entrepreneurship capacity in story. Sorry. Is there a trick to this? Is there a trick to this, Glicker? Yeah. Is it my pointing? <laughs> So one day I was in a taxi in Argentina and learned that my entrepreneur, my taxi driver, had an engineering degree. So I thought, why aren't you starting a business? And I couldn't think of the word for entrepreneur. So he kept using the word empresario, but it meant uh, a person with a Swiss bank account and all these government contacts who was from a top family. And I tried to explain, no, it's someone who's launching something innovative, who's disruptive, who. And he said, we don't have a word like that here. And I thought, oh my god, this was my aha moment, that if you don't even have a word, how do you go tell your parents this, I did this crazy thing you're going to do? Uh, and so that was when the idea of Endeavor came to be. And my co-founder co 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 and I realized that it wasn't just in Argentina, it wasn't even just in Latin America, it was across emerging markets. That at that point, there were all these barriers for people if they wanted to start and scale businesses. There was a high cost of failure. If you didn't succeed in Silicon Valley, you go to home to Thanksgiving with your next business plan. We were told if you fail a company, you actually can't show your face again. So that was, that was one of the issues. The lack of role models. People really didn't think if you weren't from one of the top 10 families that you could actually start a business. And certainly, as someone said, no one's going to give me money to start my crazy idea. Unlike Steve Jobs, I don't even have a garage. There was you know, limited access to mentors and talent and capital. There was no venture capital. And this was back in 1997, outside of the US or pockets like Israel and very few places in the world. So we said, all right, what if there were an organization to help people overcome this? And so my co-founder and I came up with Endeavor, and we said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find the talent. We know there's smart capital, and we're going to be like Switzerland. Endeavor will bridge the trust barrier, because there was no real trust. It was social capital that was, that was lacking. And so we decided we're going to start this as a nonprofit, but we said one day it's going to be self-sustaining. Don't worry. Well, we discussed this business plan over my kitchen table, and my parents sort of overheard. And by now, uh, I had graduated. It was a few years after Yale Law School. I'd gone to work in the interim, I should have said, for Ashoka Innovators for the Public, which was the first social venture capital firm. Then we started in de Then I did some odd you know, projects for Yale Law School. And then I worked for, in, for I, I was thinking of starting Endeavor. And my dad comes up, and he says, Linda, um, you know, you don't have a trust fund here. Like, you actually have to earn a living. And I thought about it, and I sort of said, what do I want to do? Do I want to do what's safe and expected and, you know, go to work in a law firm or go to McKinsey or to Goldman Sachs? Or do I want to do what, what's calling me, but what's kind of unsafe and unknown? And I started calling this my kitchen table moment, and I resolved at that moment that not only was I going to do this crazy idea, but that I was going to help others with their own sort of kitchen table moments. And I was going to help that taxi driver who didn't have a word, you know, to describe what he was doing. Um, so, sorry, back. All right. If someone can help. <laughs> so, we needed money. 
And that was the only problem. And so we needed money to start Endeavor, and my co-founder was, was putting a little bit in, but he, he needed me to match the money. And we needed $200,000. So I thought, okay, well, we're going to start in Latin America. There's one guy I'd heard of who had been an entrepreneur. His name was Eduardo Elstein. And he, at that point, had made George Soros the largest real estate owner in the country because he had walked into his office and come out with a $10 million check for his investment. So I had gotten a 10-minute meeting with Eduardo. And five minutes into our meeting, he looks at his watch and he says, I get it. You want a meeting with George Soros. I'll see what I can do. And I said, Eduardo, I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. Endeavor is of, by, and for entrepreneurs. I don't want George Soros. I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. And he looks at his right-hand guy, and he says, esta chica está loca. And he's like, this girl's crazy. What is she thinking? And I said to him, uh, Eduardo, estoy decepcionado. You know, I'm, uh, this was now in, I, I turned to Spanish. And I said, this from the guy who walked into George Soros and came out with $10 million. You're lucky he only asked you for 200000 And he gets up and leaves the room. And it's like Friday. He's an Orthodox Jew. So I know he's going home to Shabbat. And I think, oh, my God. I've just insulted the man. He's walked in the room. Do I leave? Do I stay? Is someone going to escort me out? So as I turned to the, 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 his right-hand guy, he doesn't know either. But, uh, a minute later, Eduardo walks back with a check and signs it on the spot. And to this day, it says it's one of his best investments. But he also gave me more than the money is I got this nickname. What? We're going to fix this? Oh, I have to point it at the laptop. Oh, okay, pollution pro problem solved. See, we're entrepreneurial here. Uh, so I got my nickname, uh, Chica Loca, and that's when I decided my, my motto was that crazy is a compliment, and the corollary to this was that if you're not being called crazy when you're starting something new, you're probably not thinking big enough. So that was the origin of, of Endeavor. No? I have to get closer. No. <laughs> okay. So, as let me share a little bit about what we are, and then a little bit of the story of what's happened, and then walk you through some of the research that our uh, team has done into what builds entrepreneurial ecosystems, and what actually is the founder pathway today for those who want to actually create, uh, uh, go into entrepreneurship. So Endeavor is the leading community of buying for entrepreneurs. And what we define, as Joanne said, we define high-impact entrepreneurs as those who dream bigger, scale forward, uh, scale faster, and pay it forward. Do you want to do this for me? Oh, yeah. OK, fine. So we've been in uh, over 40 markets, uh, countries in 26 years. You want to keep going? How about, that's what I'll do. When I press, then you'll know. And then we got to, OK, that's what we're going to do. Uh, now, Endeavor by the Numbers is fine, but I always want to, I'm going to take you the stories. Our entrepreneurs are creating four, four million jobs and generate four, $50 billion in revenue. You'll see that the 25,000 entrepreneurs have been selected from over 50,000 know, know, applicants, and uh, we have 600 employees around the world. But let's, let's go a little deeper. So, Endeavor, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so what Endeavor looks for is uh, what we call the Endeavor Triangle. We're looking for founders who are going to be inspiring role models with businesses that actually have a lot of growth potential that can actually be innovative and change, uh, solve world, world problems at scale. And then we look at an inflection point. Is this a business that Endeavor can help 10x to where we are? Usually we'll get them from about $10 million to $100 million in revenue, okay, more, more or less. And we'll give them a number of supports. And one of the things that's interesting is it used to be access to capital. But from the beginning, people would say, actually, it's about dreaming bigger. 
No one, we were thinking too small. Why can't we expand to the next country? Why can't we you know, think differently if we have 10 franchises, thinking about 100 or 1,000? We have a peer network now, though, globally, of people who've actually IPO'd their companies or taken them from 10 employees to 100 to 1,000. So a lot of times, founders, it's a lonely job out there. So a lot of what we're doing is a peer-to-peer -peer network. The other thing, we'll keep going. Um, is we give them this platform to pay it forward. We believe that there's an inherent connection between entrepreneurs and, and philanthropy and investing in your communities. But people need a platform. Entrepreneurs like things that are convenient and efficient in scale. The other thing I should say is about 10 years into Endeavor, we got a call from the editor of the Portuguese Brazilian Dictionary saying that they were going to add the words emprendedor and emprendedorismo for entrepreneur and entrepreneurship into the lexicon. So so today, the taxi driver can, uh, can actually tell his mom what, what we're doing. Oh, in fact, and wait a minute, I forgot. I told Joanne that this is my, uh, as part of my empty nest, this is my sixth continent in six weeks. And two weeks ago, so I was in Santiago, Chile, where Endeavor Chile was celebrating our 25th anniversary. And one of my team members who started in Brazil uh, came into the room and says, you're not gonna believe this, but my taxi driver uh, started up a conversation with me and I said I was from this organization, Endeavor, and that now we had a fund and what we're doing. He says, I know Endeavor. This is really great that you're supporting these entrepreneurs and we really need more venture capital in Chile. So I thought that was full circle when, uh, when, when the, entrepreneur, when the a taxi driver speak. Uh, okay. But as I mentioned, so Endeavor started as a nonprofit partly because 26 years ago there was no venture capital in these markets. But we always said we're going to be self sustaining based on the success of the entrepreneurs. So in 2012, we actually created a rules based fund where it's based on a 50 50 model. So in limited partners, the investors, get on a deal by deal basis their money back, their principal back, and 50% of the returns. And 50% goes to make the nonprofit self sustaining. And today, we've invested, we have 500 million assets under management. We've made over 300 uh, investments. We've had 24 exits. And what's exciting is this is starting to work. A, a, a third of the money invested in Endeavor Catalyst comes from the very entrepreneurs we support. And in two, uh, 2021, Endeavor was named one of the five most prolific investors in unicorns. And this was in 2021. Today, that was, we had 31 unicorns. Today we have 51 unicorns. That's 51 companies valued at over a billion dollars. And this is after taking out people who are no longer unicorns. These are actually people who still today are growing and prospering. So this is just to give you a sense of, of, of where we are now as a fund. But now I want to take you back, because now I'm going to bring you into the world as it was, and what are some of the stories we had, and then what's some of the research that we've done in terms of how to build these entrepreneurial ecosystems. So back in 1997, most of these economies were what I call tech wastelands. They're, no one ever heard of entrepreneurs. And one of the first people I met was a, a young man named Wences Casares. And Wences had grown up on a sheep farm in Patagonia. But he had created the first internet service provider, sold it, and the company promptly fired him. So undeterred, which was unusual at the time, he decided to create the E-Trade of Latin America. And 34 investors turned him down. They said, look, kid, we don't even understand what E-Trade is. There's not really a functioning stock market in Argentina. And you don't have the right last name, and they all turned him down. But we thought he's onto something, and so we brought Endeavor, him into the Endeavor Network. We helped him find uh, uh, his chief operating officer. We got him his first four million dollars in venture capital. Wences also ended up marrying my assistant, so he got the full service Endeavor. And then 18 months later, he sold to Banco Santander for $750 million. Now this is, sorry, I'm just gonna grab the water. This is in 1998, so that would be about $1.2 billion in today's currency. This got a lot of attention. So first of all, all 34 investors called me up and said, uh, do you have another strange kid with another <laughs> crazy idea that we might invest in this time? But 
Two of the people that listened to the story were Stanford MBAs, Marcus Galbraith and Hernan Kaza, that would have that would have stayed in Silicon Valley. This is now 1998. You can imagine eBay and other companies are thriving. And they decided, no, you know what? We're going to go back to Argentina and build the eBay of Latin America. And they actually were able, because of Wences' story, to get some capital. In fact, including from the same investor that had seen Wences. And then some of the others who realized they'd missed the first story. In 2007, Mercado Libre went public on the NASDAQ. And today is the highest valued company in all of Latin America. Its market cap is about $90 billion. So, for in 2003, this was in the middle of our, um, uh, Mercado Libre's journey. So, Patagon had sold. They heard about Wences. They heard about what uh, Marcos and Hernan were building. And so, four corporate employees decide, oh, whoops, sorry, you can, uh, that they are going to start Globant um, as a digitally native software uh, services company, taking on Tata, Accenture, WPP, all the big guns. In 2014, they went public, and today it's about a $12 billion market cap company, and they're actually beating out Accenture and Tata for many deals. Uh, they do much of uh, Disney's back-end uh, software development. And so what we realized when all of these people would, would reference the other, and we said, you know, there's something going on here. And I likened it to the British runner, and I, you know, Roger Bannister. And Roger Bannister was a British runner uh, who was running in the 1950s. And up until the 1950s, so this is 70 years ago this year, up until then, in human history, it was believed that no one could run a four minute, under four-minute mile. It was just impossible. That was just taken for granted that a sub-four-minute mile was impossible. So in 1954, uh, he, Roger Bannister runs a three minute and 59.4 second mile. Impossible in history. The record lasts 46 days. And today, over 1,600 runners have broken the uh, sub four minute mile. And so what we realized is it's this mental shift. Like if people were saying, if Wences can do it, I can do it too, right? If Bannerster can do it, I can too. And so we said, wow, if you take these emerging market founders and you tell their stories, it's sort of, it's the role model effect. We can encourage uh, a multiplier effect. But then we said, wait a minute, but there's more here that's going on. It's not just inspiration. The founders are actually actively helping other founders overcome the barriers we spoke of when Endeavor was starting. So we went to our friends at Bain and we said, why don't we do a study? Why don't we actually look at the ecosystems? And what we did was we, we said, why don't we uh, look for what we're going to call the multiplier effect? So we said, Let's, this is the process whereby founders inspire, mentor, train, and invest in the next generation. And we said, if we could actually have proof points of how this happens, then we can look at how tech ecosystems are jump-started. So what we did, and we started in Argentina, and what we did is we surveyed 200 companies that we did not know. They were too early for Endeavor. Endeavor's always been about the scale-up phase, not the startup phase. So we interviewed 200 startups, and we asked them four questions. We asked them who mentored you? Who invested in you? Did you work for uh, a, an entrepreneurial company before, or are you a serial entrepreneur, and who inspired you? Those four questions. And we traced back, no, 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 just to keep, keep, to keep here for a second, I'll tell you one. So we traced back to who they had talked about, and what they had said, and when those companies were built. And we realized that between 1982 and 1999, Nothing was happening in Argentina. Over a 14-year period, there are only 14 tech companies built, one per year. Okay? This is, includes Mercado Libre and Globant. There are only 12 other tech companies in that entire 14-year period. And if you look at the connections, who mentored you, who inspired you, there's, there's very little going on here. Okay, now let's go. Now it's 2007, so now this is when Globant and some others are coming in. So you see more circles, or what we call bubbles. And, but there's still not that much in terms of the connectivity. Now, 2014, we did it again. Look at what's happened. 
So not only are there more blue bubbles, that's more and more and more circles, those are the number of tech companies, but the lines, the inspiration, the mentorship, the training, the working in other companies, suddenly this is a really dense ecosystem. There's a lot of connectivity. And so then we said, but wait a minute, there's something else going on here. If you look, some of the big bubbles are bigger than others. Okay, and we said, what, what does this mean? And what it meant was, these are the people that most actively inspired, mentored, trained, and invested in others. So now we said, what would happen if we took away just those four big bubbles? What would happen? It's back to 1999. You wanna go backwards? So this is what it looks like in 2014. Just take away the four teal bubbles, and this is what it is, okay? They're all Endeavor entrepreneurs, by the way. And so we thought, wow, this is palpable. If you do not in, reinvest in this ecosystem, it's not gonna happen on its own. We repeated the study in Istanbul, in Lagos. We've done this now in, in, in over 30 markets. It's all the same. It's always three to four uh, companies make the difference in an ecosystem. So now we go to people and we say, how big is your bubble? Um, so, this is what we realized. So this is the, the, the bubbles, the multiplier effect. This is what breeds an ecosystem. And we can talk about later what not to do if you want a tech ecosystem, but we'll talk about that in the, in the Q&A. Let's keep going. So now Endeavor, so we went from Latin America to, in 2004, we launched in South Africa. We're now in uh, five markets in Africa. In the Middle East in 2007, we're in eight markets in the Middle East. Asia, we launched Indonesia first here uh, in 2012, and then we launched underserved, and Europe, and then underserved cities in the US. So in 2012, we came to Southeast Asia. So we launched in Singapore, and we have offices in Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, and then also they've adopted Japan. So as <laughs> part of the APAC uh, ASEAN, part of an, an endeavor. So just to share a few of the, the stories we found um, in, in, in our part of the Endeavor Network. So um, our, one of our first entrepreneurs was Aldi. He, he uh, Harry Pratimo, who started a company called Mapan that ended up selling to Gojek and he ended up creating GoPay out of, out, of, of, out of Gojek. And he was first going into cities looking to how to, women literally selling goods and how they could have collective bargaining by giving them um, financial access. And then that developed into what he built at GoPay. Uh, Zaki and uh, in Fadrin of Bukalapak. And then uh, one of our more recent entrepreneurs, uh, a woman who's creating a uh, fashion conscious brand, Button Scarves, that scarves in for, um, for more modest fashion. What I love about her is she is our first Endeavor entrepreneur named Linda. So, <laughs> special place in my heart. Uh, in uh, Malaysia, Karsam uh, became the first Malaysian unicorn. Uh, we have the Fashion Valet group. Uh, tea Live, uh, which many of you may have drunk their teas. We also, I was just with uh, uh, the founder of uh, a company called Holstein Milk. Uh, how many of you have tasted farm fresh milk? So it's this much. And I said to him, Loy, he was just with us the other day. I said, Loy, how much, you know, what's your, you know, uh, your, what were your annual revenues last year? He said, $160 million. It's like, pretty good. And he said, now we're going to go to the Philippines next. So these are all dynamic, high growth companies. Uh, in, in the Philippines, Coins is one of the uh, first kind of Bitcoin companies in the region. Uh, Cloud Eats is a virtual kitchen and, and Grocery Online, e commerce. Um, and then in Vietnam, it's been super interesting. There's this entire sort of gaming culture that's come out, and so we have some of the top gaming companies. We'll keep going. Um, and then here in Singapore, uh, we have phenomenal companies, including Caro, Aspire, Credivo, and, and, and many others. So uh, that's just a simple a sample of some of the companies we're working with in, in the region. But then we noticed something else, back to the multiplier effect, and back to what we were seeing here in Southeast Asia, as well as in the Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. We said, there's something else going on that reminds me of the PayPal mafia. Uh, now, my, my board member is Reed Hoffman, and he always tells me, call it the PayPal network. I was like, Reed, own the mafia. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, the PayPal mafia 
is the group of, of early founders that have gone on to, to found some of the most prolific and well-known companies in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And they all support and invest in one another. But they also train one another. And so what we started seeing was that the second generation actually was getting to success faster than the first generation. So this is Rappi in uh, the, the Latin America. About 50 companies have come, or 50 to 100 have come out of the Rappi mafia. Similarly, in the Middle East, uh, the, uh, Kareem sold to Uber for $3 billion. And now, probably one in five founders in the, throughout the Middle East has had their start at Kareem. And now what we're seeing here is we're starting to see the beginning of mafia. So these are the next generation that have trained in some of the earliest companies uh, that you see here. And what this means is that they're getting the benefit of that mentorship. They're getting the benefit of that training. So back to Aldi. So this was Aldi when he was doing Mapan. And one of the people that he mentors directly is uh, Gibran of eFishery. And Gibran grew up in a fishing culture and now realized that there, were, there was an efficiency in terms of how much the feed, you didn't know how much your feed you were giving, and you didn't have any direct access to markets in the United States. So he created eFishery both to help the aquaculture tech uh, culture and then actually deliver the fish to places like Legal Seafood in, in the US. And he became a unicorn last year and mentored by Aldi. And then also out of uh, the, the Gojek Mafia, this is Dara of Pinhome, it's a prop tech company. And you're starting to see, as I said, this next generation that's been trained that knows how to build and scale businesses. So that was the second. So the first piece is about the big bubbles and about the idea of the multiplier effect. The second is saying, OK, there's something about these mafias and the next generation that's, that can scale even faster. I'll leave you with one more piece of research, and then I look forward to all your questions. And that was something we did this past year. We said, all right, there are all these unicorns now. These are the billion dollar companies. What are the pathways to becoming a unicorn founder? Can we back into what, what they are? And we learned, and what we learned was, Actually, you know, most people have a conception that there's one road to becoming a, path, a, a, a successful founder. And we said, no, 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 actually, what if there was a completely different road that no one expected, but that actually has a greater chance of producing a unicorn? So we did this research, and we actually uh, looked at 200 unicorn founders. Uh, the ones in purple half, 100, were the top unicorns, so the, the highest valued unicorns, privately held companies for, were worth a billion dollars from the US, and half were from emerging markets, and 30 of those were Endeavor entrepreneurs. So let's, and what we, happened, we realized was we shattered four myths. So let's see what those are. So the first myth said, to become a founder, you have to go to an elite school. That's, that's the number one thing. And as it turns out, the vast majority of founders, I think 70%, did not go to an elite school. They either went to uh, a lesser known brand or were self-taught. That's number one. The second thing was everyone said, oh, well, everyone's majoring in business or getting MBAs. As it turns out, again, the vast majority, I think over 60%, studied engineering, and only one in five of the unicorn founders got MBAs. The next. Okay, well, unicorn founders are young. They start their businesses in the garage. They start it in their dorm rooms, right? Well, it turns out that 80% of the unicorns have over 10 years of work experience. I think that's right. I may have gotten the numbers off, but the vast majority have 10 years or more work experience. And the last myth that we shattered was that if you're going to have this experience, it's going to be at the, at the Magnificent Seven, what used to, you know, right? It's going to be at one of the top uh, tech companies, or it's going to be Bain or McKinsey, one of the top consulting firms, or one of the top investment banks. And it turns out, like we'd seen before, that the best training ground is in other startups. And that the vast majority of unicorn founders, only 20% actually went to these traditional big businesses to gain their experience. And the vast majority either were serial entrepreneurs or had been to another uh, one of a, a prior unicorn before them or prior startup before. 
So what does this mean for all of you? And what it means is that, well, first of all, this is one of our selection panels. This is in Bali last year. I hope to see a number of you and those on Zoom at a future Endeavor selection panel. I hope many of you will actually start your companies and join us. And what I welcome you all to do, these are some of our outliers, our fastest growing companies. Maybe we'll see you among those. And join the mafia, right? The best companies, and this is an exciting time. And I think this is a really exciting time because the money isn't free flowing as we know, and we can talk about that too. This is the time people are you know, struggling to get to profitability. They're having to rethink what is a real business model? What do consumers really want? This is the best time to go out and get training. The next is think big and scale up, right? So dream big. This is the time to, to find if you have a problem that you believe no one else is solving or there's a pain point out there that you know that you can do better. This is when the great companies are born. And most of the companies that end up being successful are born in periods of recession or downturn. It turns out that ha over half the Fortune 500 company in the US was born during a downturn. So, so I think that times when everyone's pessimistic is the time for entrepreneurs to get going. And then lastly, uh, I hope all of you and whatever you'll do will take uh, this lesson of, of paying it forward. Because as I always say to people, uh, a unicorn that doesn't create more unicorns is just an endangered species. Thank you. Even with the clicker problems, we ended on time. <laughs> it was fantastic. What a fantastic talk. Um, I have to say, I've never thought about it. Uh, unicorns as endangered species. I think that is a, a great moment. Let me just say, we're going to open up the mics and invite all of you to, uh, to come, come forward and, and ask questions when you're ready. But let me start. I, I like the fact that you started with this statistic that in difficult times, this is when we often see the birth of successful yeah. ventures. And when we look around the world right now, it feels difficult. You know, inflation yeah. is high, geopolitics feel uncertain. People are nervous. Many of our students are nervous about what the future holds for them as we see some of the disruptive technologies coming into place. And I, I was wondering if, if you would just talk a little bit more. You know, I know everyone says this is Asia's century, but as Endeavor is going deeper and deeper into Asia, what, what, would, you, what would you share on this? Well, yeah, I feel like I was, I was the most optimistic person at a lot of my meetings this week. <laughs> Uh, and I would say that, especially among the venture capital community, there's been a little bit of doom and gloom uh, speaking. But I, I was just with these 30 NUS, Yale and U.S. grads on, on Sunday, and it was inspiring. You know, a number of them were doing angel investing and as sort of a, a, a side hustle to whatever they were doing. A number were working in creative fields. A number had said, okay, well, I got a job at a traditional bank or traditional, and then I, I just couldn't do it. So I'm starting out, and I just thought, what, how great. Like, this is the time, what I told them, before you have the mortgages and the kids and the, and, um, and that, you can, that you can take that, that chance. And I think that what we're seeing uh, now is innovations can come from anywhere in the world. And I think that what I've heard from a lot of people, especially in Southeast Asia, is that the first wave of entrepreneurs was a lot of what the people call copycats. Now, I don't like that because I feel like even, you know, there's a lot of adaptation. I mean, try being grab and gojek dealing with, you know, the, 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 the Southeast Asia in, in, you know, Indonesia is not exactly an easy place. It's not the same as going, you know, starting Uber, you know, in, in uh, San Francisco. So I feel like, so I don't love the term copycats, but I understand what they're sort of saying is, do we have anything innovative? But I, I think that there are, there are so many opportunities that this region of the world is, is so rich and with the differences in regulation, with the differences in language, the, the companies that are able to solve these regional problems 
can then go to any market in the world. And I think that's super exciting. So, um, and then I've also been talking to people who are looking at green tech. We just looked at e-fishery that's aquaculture tech, right? I, so I feel like there's, you know, it doesn't have to be deep tech. It doesn't have to be AI. I think that it's about, what's exciting, what I would also tell all of you is that we're, we're seeing in other markets, Brazil, Mexico, you know, Nigeria, Spain, so much there's similarities to what's happening in this part of the world that I also think that, you know, sometimes it's about we look to the U.S. or we look to China, but actually it's about the emerging market to emerging market. Uh, this is more developed than emerging market, but I think the Southeast Asia as a, as a region can look to places like Latin America, can look to the Middle East, and there's so much mutual learning, and that's what gets me excited. That's great. Okay, we have, oh, Yes, we have a few questions, a uh, few questions already. Uh, why don't we, while well, there's so many, okay, why don't we start here and we'll work I love it. across, yes. And people online too. Anyone online still? Uh, Hi Linda, I'm Hi. Edward. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I love it. And I'm really one, I'm a senior here at the LNUS, and I'm really wondering about your, I'm really interested with your, the concept of multiplier effect. And I'm wondering, do, do you think that multiplier effect still exists in former startups. What I mean is that Google or mm -hmm. Facebook, they were once a startup, but by oh. now they are more of a traditional established company. So do you think if I join this company, sort of companies these days, will I still enjoy the same kind of multiplier effect? Thank you. Yeah, I think it takes a different form. I think that you know Google is very proud of its Googlers and uh, but I think that, and I think that just as, you know, the consulting firms have their alumni networks, right? So I think you would get training programs. I think you would get a lot of support if you did decide to leave and, and you would build a network. So from all of those reasons, yes. I think it is different, though, than scaling with scarce resources on the entrepreneurial venture. So I do think that while you can get great uh, managerial or coding or other experience and that that and and bring it to bear and we still have a lot of people who come with those experiences and bring them back I think that there's two I think that it there's something different about working in now a cash strapped fast growing environment where you're going from 10 employees to 100 employees it's different than being there with 10 tens of thousands of employees at this point. So it's just a matter of, of what do you want? You'll, you, there's certainly, they care about, as I said, their alumni network. There's a lot of people um, and there's still a lot of entrepreneurship happening within Alphabet uh, or within Meta, right? But I do think the people I know who are at Facebook or Google now, it's, it's, it is different than the early days when it was really kind of hungry and, and agile. Hello, thank you. My name is Ricky Law. I, uh, I'm starting a startup in Singapore called the Sunshine Seniors, and we are uh, admitted to the Alibaba SUSS inter incubator program uh, just 2023. So my question is, is any member in your community over the age of 60? Yeah, well, in fact, I just mentioned Loy of Holstein Milk, the farm fresh, who is uh, who is, uh, I think, maybe even 70, I'm not sure. We have uh, so, uh, one of our entrepreneurs from Vietnam uh, is, uh, is in his 70s, so absolutely. Well, that is great because um, one of the things is because we are not tech, we are not AI, all those fancy words and then technology and then the uh, example that you show us, right, grab on all this kind of, we are not. So without all these beautiful and then a sort of the technology thing, so uh, it's good that you say that well, age may not be an issue, so I'll try my best and then I'll do my best. And I thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, and look, and I think everything these days has some tech component. One of the, uh, the Vietnam entrepreneurs I mentioned has actually a, a, a very well-known restaurant chain and food franchise. And we thought, okay, this is a little different than a lot of what we see, but it's, he's built this incredible food franchise and still wants to 10x from 
uh, the tens of tens and tens of millions of dollars he does in revenue now, he still has very big ambitions. And he said, "Wait a minute! What do you mean I'm not tech? I'm a tech company." <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and I thought that's beautiful. Of course you are. So so don't sell yourself short. But yes, it can be tech enabled, not tech centric, and that's fantastic. Okay, last question. So yeah. I can get the uh, contact of your Singapore office online, right? So that I can uh, communicate. Yeah, and, and uh, Kella is here, who is 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 our is uh, number one employee in Singapore. So okay, that'll uh, be great so then. Right, you can stalk her after, even better. <laughs> okay, that'll be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Lena. My name is Roy. Hi. I'm a Yale U.S. alumni uh, from class of 23. And uh, I'm actually from Mexico. And Fantastic. Yeah, sorry? Fantastic. Oh, wonderful. So I, I started working in startups uh, throughout the years, working in this expansion team and a lot of these things. Yeah. And having followed the journey of Endeavor for some years, I think I have two questions. One of them is, how do you guys weigh in um, the way that you guys enter certain mar markets or certain sectors, given the maturity of the sectors. When I think about this, for example, e-commerce uh, in certain markets is still more marketplace driven than what you would think uh, a brand.com kind of market, right? Like it, that's what some markets, uh, some markets are more mature than others. So when you think about like the startups that you're bringing into your, your network, mm -hmm. how do you wade into the, the maturity of those markets yeah. across these countries? Well, it's a good question. How do we wade into the maturity of the markets? The answer is we don't because we're looking for founders. We're looking for the entrepreneurs, and they're, they, but they have to create businesses that have gotten to a certain scale. As I said, usually people are coming to us more or less with 10, some come at 100 million in revenue and they have to get to a billion in revenue, some come sub 10 million, but most are coming between about five and 15 million by the time they come through our local process to this international selection panel where they have to be unanimously selected. And so they, they need to be able to 10X. So they're telling us what what are the problems that they're to solve. So we, we are agnostic, I would say uh, the majority of our um, companies are in uh, fintech and uh, SA, B2B, SaaS. We do have a number of e-commerce. We do have F&B companies. We have health tech. We have ag tech, ed tech. Um, but it runs like the gamut. Here in, in Southeast Asia, what we've been saying is there's much more kind of B2C, business to consumer and e-commerce than we've seen elsewhere. There's much more F&B. There's much less of the business to business SaaS sort of models. There's not as much deep tech as we've seen in, in, in certain parts of the world. But we're not coming in and deciding. We're finding the great founders. And, and sometimes people will say, hey, you think it's a mature market, but we have a way to disrupt it further. So, so that's, that's, how we, that's how we would answer it. Right, amazing. And then there comes my second quick question, which basically is that a lot of investors, what happens is that um, I, I see, for example, from your presentation, the, the word unicorn, it's mentioned a lot, right? Like yeah. it, it's part of like what creates a metric for success for a lot of these uh, VCs and, and many of that. However, it's like a lot of the pressure of like these VCs, their interest in like is getting those so sexy, it's getting those IPOs. I guess in the case of Endeavor, how do you guys weigh in, for example, metrics like the sustainability of your companies that they create the most jobs of the most impact uh, and they stay profitable for the longest time, right? Yeah. Like, what, what's the DNA of those endeavor like? Well, I love, I love that question. And let me say, first of all, one of the things I love about, that I didn't mention about our 50-50 fund, Endeavor Catalyst, is that not only are we, uh, are we splitting its shared profits, right? So 50% is going to support the nonprofit and 50% is going back to the investors. So by already the investors, and by the way, they're getting top tier returns because we're globally diversified and we're getting into all these great deals because we invest in the Endeavor entrepreneurs when they're raising lead rounds. We don't take lead roles ever. We'll only invest up to $2 million in a round, which means we're always on the side of the entrepreneur. So one of the things is we're always helping the entrepreneur. And even when, and in these hard times, we've seen a lot of friction between founders and 
uh, the funders, the funders invested in them, they gave them these huge valuations, and they said, grow at all costs, and they're like, wait a minute, you're not profitable tomorrow? <laughs> they're like, wait a minute, you told us not to be profitable, to, to grow, and, 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 and my view is that the pendulum was way too far one way and is now way too far the other, and so we're able to work with entrepreneurs, even when some are leaving the companies, right, and we help them elegantly kind of figure out how to leave, and wait and go on sabbatical and rest and then start their new thing. So I think that's one thing is I think you find out in times like this who's really founder friendly or founder first because a lot of people talk the talk but that's not not true. And so I think that the other thing is, you know, there are some people who got over their skis and what I think is that even though it's really painful and hard, and especially you know, as a founder or someone going through it to see the, the reduction in forces, the rifts, the layoffs, I think for an ecosystem, when we're able to see, and I've, we've been through enough cycles, that we see that even companies that don't make it, there's so much learning, and most of those people go on to like found something else, they've gotten the bug, and they're really smart and they don't make, and you learn from the mistakes as much as you learn from the successes. So I think that to be able to give people a picture of this isn't the worst disaster, okay? As long as people, um, you know, can take care of their families, and so we help them figure out how can you minimize the negative impact on families, right, so that you can then, it's okay, they, you know, they can, they can start the next thing. And then I think that it's the role models of showing the people who've not only built these sustainable businesses, but by showing the people who have been paying it forward. Mudassar Sheikha of Kareem um, is now our chairman of Endeavor in Pakistan. Uh, Martin Magoya of Globant is the chair of Endeavor in Argentina, and Marcos Galperin of Mercado Libre is the vice chair. All these people are getting involved and giving back. We're explain and that's the second thing. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, when we've gotten our founders together, this peer-to-peer -to -peer learning, then one of the number one things they're talking about is mental health. And even the folks that have succeeded have talked about how after an exit, which is seen as the be all end all, that they have what someone described last week as postpartum, right? And their baby's gone, their purpose is gone. And so we've had those founders who are a little further ahead talk to, um, talk to people. So I think things like taking care of your employees and mental health, I think, are much more important to us as goals than just sort of saying, tick the box ESG, tick the box, right? Some word like sustainability. So I think that that's, we look at it in a more holistic lens. But great, great question. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was great to hear. See ya. April. Hello, um, I'm April Hu, and I'm actually an engineer from Yale, uh, Yale College, and uh, I'm a mother of four, uh, and I am right now on, on my third startup. Amazing. And it's on, called CLAP, which is a Chinese language accelerator program. Um, my question is, how, how would you explore the area for a woman to balance family and also balance different stages of life. Uh, in Singapore at the moment, almost 14.3% of women working have decided not to have a family or to have children. And this is, these are women in the, in the business world. And I think this is also particularly true in Asia because of uh, culture and uh, um, societal pressures. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, and I, I'm here to yeah. s hopefully set, set, a, set as a role model but I would be really be love to hear from you. That's great. By the way, all these questions have been so wonderful. Um, well, first of all, I was just at a table, uh, Kelly and I were just at lunch with a table of female VCs, and I thought, wow, this is, you know, and we could have doubled that room, and I thought, there, there are not many markets where that is true, and even, the, even in the U.S., sometimes I, I, I look around and there's not that many women, so I thought, think that was impressive here. Um, I've also been noting a lot of, 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 of gains. We've seen a lot more uh, female chief technology officers, for example, which is very exciting. And even in some of our markets, like Saudi Arabia, I, I always say, I ask the question to every tech founder in Saudi, what's the percentage of female engineers? 
And the answer in every Saudi Arabian tech company, 40 to 60%. So I think the world is going to continue to evolve. So that's on, on the one side in terms of seeing more women taking these leadership roles, being founders. Um, I personally uh, made a conscious decision to always talk about my daughters. Um, I am a very active mom, and I think you know the fact that I, I now have this empty nest. Now, 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 everyone knows. Oh, Linda can travel again. That's why six continents, six weeks. <laughs> but that's because I didn't travel for a lot, a lot, a lot of time, even. Uh, I thank goodness for COVID and Eric Yuan who created Zoom because that really helped. But for a long time, people understood that um, that I was going to grow Endeavor. I'm an entrepreneur. I love what I do, but I was, you know, going to, you know, not look back, you know, uh, and and say I regretted not being there for breakfast and. Um, my, my, I remember when I was going off to Davos in Switzerland and the, my daughters were five and one of them tugged on my leg and she said, just remember, you can be an entrepreneur for a short time, but you are a mommy forever. So I think that, um, you know, what I like is that, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg has now been very vocal about his uh, parental leave. I think we need more of this and I think that, uh, the world, I think Zoom did help. I think there were a lot of parents who saw kids running around and, and realized, like, why do we want this to stop? I think the idea of maybe the work week looks different, the back to the office isn't necessarily five days a week. Now, it's not great if we're always remote, but maybe there's something more hybrid. So I feel like there's hopefully going to be more creativity, more leadership. I also think you know, there's going to be with Gen Z and the Gen Alpha after them, people who've come up with, with working, working mothers and parents much more than, than at least, you know, my, my generation had. So, I don't know. I'm the optimist, so I'm hopeful. But I think to your point of you saying you're a role model, I think those of us who, who do do both have to be intentional about not doing what I was told to do, which is never talk about your kids. And I, I sort of said, no, I'm doing the opposite. What, did, what, did, what would you answer to that? I have to say, I, I think I talk about my kids almost too much. Um, but I, I feel the same way. I feel like we have to make it possible for our staff and for our students to see a different way. I was definitely told, if you have to leave work a million years ago, if you have to leave work early because your kid's sick, you should lie. You should never leave work because your kid's sick. You should say, wow. I've got a really big project and I can concentrate better at home. And I made the decision to never do that. So people know where my kids are. They know that one's homesick and I'm popping up and down. They know that I'm yes. going to the dentist. And I think, you know, those of us who are a little bit older than, our, um, than some of the other people here, it's, it's a responsibility. You yeah. know, it's part of lowering the ladder, I think. Yeah. My problem is now people are like, you don't have that excuse anymore. <laughs> we know you're not sitting home making breakfast for Tybee and Eden, so we know you can get on the plane. <laughs> um, how, about, uh, how about in the front here and then there? And then, Tricia, we haven't taken any from Zoom. Sorry, there's so many questions. Uh, right here, please. These have been great questions. Yeah, we should get to the people on Zoom too, though. Yeah. Thank you very much. I thought you can only look that side only, uh, because I raised a couple of times my hands, and thank you very much, OK, because of you, uh, they have got the attention. Uh, Linda, wonderful presentation. Uh, just I wish, wish to know, because you use the word mafia, join the mafia. Mm -hmm. And connotation, understanding when you say mafia is not in a positive sense. You know it. Now. My question would be on that, can we get these mafias to solve some of the very challenging questions, problems the world is facing, for example, climate change? If you believe in that, if you are a Republican, you may not yeah. believe in that, but okay, uh, that is your, your choice. I will not say anything about it. But now that is the one problem. Example, even today we know almost close to two billion people do not have access to the good uh, drinking water itself. Can we get these mafias to solve that problem rather than just 
earning billions and billions and maybe just increasing the share values. And I don't know where they spend their money later on, just buying private jets or something. So this is one part. And second, uh, just a question. The, have you been to India? Uh, I have not seen in your chart there. So are you a little bit scared to go to India? Or if you wish, if uh, you wish, if you wish this weekend, I can ex get you an appointment to go there. Okay. Nice. Uh, I have been to India. I, I, it's an amazing country. Um, we had made a decision that we needed to be pulled into countries rather than push our model. And when we thought about going to India, this is true with China and Israel too, people sort of, enough people said, but we have a lot going on that Endeavor can't be as catalytic as in other places. And so that was our decision. Every few years, people come up to me. I, mean, I was just with somebody yesterday who's Indian who said, you should still go to India. I was with Vinny Bonsal uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 last year. He said, you should still go to India. So we always, never say never, um, but that's what we had decided is that unless we're being pulled in and that there was this sense that you know we have enough of an ecosystem started, that was, that was the only reason we think and we have a lot of connectivity with a lot of Indian founders and they're part of our network and uh, yeah. we've taken uh, a lot of our founders on tours to China and we will to India uh, because we think it's important to, to, to have them in this, in this global network, but it was just where, um, where we chose to focus. Um, on your first one, yes, I am, I'm using Mafia, partly tongue-in-cheek and partly because the PayPal Mafia became known. I mean, that's why Reid Hoffman, who's not, tells me, I don't want that word. <laughs> Use the networks. And I, I, I jokingly say, I said to own oh, the mafia because the PayPal mafia became this sense of the, the people, um, you know, like Peter Thiel mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and obviously Elon Musk and, and, and others who came out of it, you know, thinking, thinking bigger. And I think that it's just a way to kind of capture people's attention to talk about the Kareem Mafia or the Gojek Mafia. We, we understand that we're not talking Don Corleone here. <laughs> um, I, I, I will say it was interesting when we launched Endeavor Italy and tried to talk about the mafias. <laughs> but now they do, the tech mafia. But, I, but I, to your point, I think that one of the things I've said about my, what I love about working in emerging and growth markets and places where capital has been scarcer than in Silicon Valley is that entrepreneurs here, I find, are really trying to solve real world problems at scale and not just reverse engineer the, the, you know, the next billion dollar company. Though I understand the idea that uni part of a unicorn is just it's something tangible and it is something that gets attention, but that that's not the end, the end goal. So we find that people, even in FinTech, a lot of it's about financial inclusion. A lot of it is that banks are not working for people. If you look at a uh, new bank in, that came out of Brazil, that's the biggest neobank really in the world. And that the, the, people, the, the traditional banks were not servicing these clients, right? I think even um, a lot of the e-commerce companies are, are trying to give access to whether it's mom and pop stores that didn't under, have a way to sell their goods online or to give access to the people who um, to, to need to buy them. So I think that, um, yes, there'll be more climate change work. It tends to be capital intensive. It tends to be deep tech oriented. So I think that's where a lot of the barriers are. I don't think it's for what I've seen, a lack of vision or a lack of desire to be part of solving important challenges. It's realistic. What does my skill set and what is my ability to get the resources I need going to be able to solve? And I'd say that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. But fair point. Let's get it right behind you. And then Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Linda. Thank you for the inspiring talk. Um, I work for an inter intermediary organization where we facilitate philanthropic capital to charity and charitable projects worldwide. Uh -huh. You mentioned very briefly about philanthropy in yes. your talk, and I'm just curious, where does that play in the ecosystem? Uh, we see more and more, you know, especially social enterprises coming to us as to get the philanthropic capital before or alongside the you know, regular capital for the investment um, for growth. So I'm just curious from your from your experience, where do you see in this ecosystem philanthropists come in? Yeah. And also if you, if Endeavor does like the hybrid investment model where you invest alongside with philanthropic capital, um, 
Yeah, we'd love to hear about that. Well, we, it's interesting. We while we don't while we're mainly invest we're we're investing in you know high growth for profit businesses that that often are solving a, a, a problem, but there it's 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 the investment capital. We ourselves received philanthropic capital before we had our funds, right? So we ourselves are this hybrid model, and that's where the 50-50 kind of blended capital, or blended return, is giving people, they're in some of the best companies in the world, and yet part of the returns are going to support Endeavor, the nonprofit, the ecosystem builder, the mentor capitalist, as you said, in, in, in these markets. And so what has been interesting about that is our entrepreneurs have grown up with a sense of, hey, one of the, the people that were supporting us, that were investing us, themselves started as a nonprofit. And so many of them have seen a nonprofit not as some sleepy organization that doesn't work very effectively. They, they have had a better vision, I think, of what nonprofits are. And so many of them we found um, in our network are less, uh, are, are more inclined to support other other causes. But I think this uh, new generation, and I think certainly entrepreneurs, uh, I think want to have impact measurement, want to have metrics and results in their, um, in their giving. And I do think they want it to be time bound. I do think that this idea of philanthropy is sort of R&D to solve problems until the markets or governments can catch up is a good thing. So I, I think that a lot of nonprofits like us have tried to create creative solutions where philanthropy is there for a period of time, but not forever. And I think that is what more and more uh, young entrepreneurs, young people, uh, or the generation that's inheriting wealth is, is, is demanding and asking for. And I see that as a great thing. I think that this, I, I, I always say that, you know, we, the world has moved beyond the binary, right? Why is there still for-profit, non-profit? We've got to move kind of beyond binary thinking and create these more hybrid, fluid models. So when you say uh, like paying forward, yeah. when you say paying forward, do you see that, that what you meant with a lot of these organizations? organizations, uh, businesses would kind of give, not just in terms of mentorship, but also in terms of philanthropic capital to other startups? Yeah, absolutely. So they're doing it in two ways. One is they're reinvesting. So as I said, a third of our fund, right, which is the, the last, we've, we've raised four funds, so we have 500 million total, the last one was $300 million that we closed last, last year. And a third of the fund was, was, was a third of the investors are the Endeavor entrepreneurs, so they're reinvesting. And also, they're giving in philanthropic ways to other more, more charitable, more nonprofit causes, 100%. Um, and in fact, David Vela, who I mentioned, new, who created New Bank, the large new bank, became just the second Latin American, second Latin American signed on to the giving pledge, which was Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and other people pledging to give 50% or more of their, uh, their wealth away in their lifetime. The second person on the entire continent? <laughs> I mean, uh, so I think that there's, and, and he spoke at our, we had a, a, a gala where we you know, honored him last year, and you could tell the entrepreneurs in the room were all saying, wait a minute, now I want to I want to be the third, I want to be the fourth. I think making that something that people aspire to is also uh, part of the role model effect, so 100%. So look forward to talking to you afterwards, but. Yes, uh, so Ed online, um, we have another mafia question. Um, <laughs> if you're in a nascent market without a mafia or you're currently not within the right networks to access the local mafia, what would you recommend? How do you learn the ropes, improve the odds of growing your company? That's awesome. Um, one of the things that we're doing in, we did in Greece, we're doing in Lebanon, we did in Poland, is look at the diaspora. So I think that that's something that I think, you know, we, um, we've got to, it's okay, people just say, oh, if they're not living here, we can't, they're not really, you know, uh, uh, you know I impacting us. But people were inspired by people who um, all, uh, were, were born there. And so one of the things we did in, in Greece is we said, okay, look, we're gonna, we're gonna select people that are maybe in London or, may, or maybe in the States, but encourage them to set up 
uh, an R&D center there and hire people, and then that became a way to sort of get the best of both worlds. In Lebanon, we have a company in Colorado that's now setting up uh, an R&D training center in Beirut. So I think that there is, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and so some, sometimes I do think going abroad, studying abroad, working elsewhere, and then bringing back, committing to coming back to your home country, um, you know, is something. And then somebody has to go first. You know, Aldi didn't have it to me. It was Aldi. It was you know Nadim of of of, of Gojek. It was uh, you know Anthony uh, Tan and Hui Ling, uh, starting first in Malaysia with Grab and then coming here. It was Forest Lee. It was you know of C. It was you know the first uh, the, the ferry uh, of of of, of Travel and William of, of Tokopedia. It was like those are those are the ones in 2012. There was nobody else. <laughs> and so somebody has to go first. So I would say either go first, go abroad, find, uh, find a diaspora. But uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing where you're from. Maybe Endeavor can go there. I think they're starting to flash that we should, we should wrap up. I, oh. I think there's one more question. Yes, let's do that. And then. Thank you for your talk. So I'm an NUS exchange student under the NOC program. and. Um, Part of my program is I have to work in a startup. So I currently work in a startup incubator within um, NUS Enterprise. So I have a question. Um, how do you assist startups to become potential unicorns in an emerging market where many ideas, such as in deep tech or advanced industries, have already been developed elsewhere? And maybe how can you give them like a unique value proposition that can make it go international without being dubbed a copycat? Thank you. Uh, great, and if, you, if it's okay, I feel bad. If there's any more, Trisha, if there's any, like one or two more, we can do it quickly. I will answer quickly, but uh, no, for the online, I just want to make sure the people online uh, get a chance. Um, so, look, we, 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 we work with a lot of the incubators and accelerators and have a scale-up program between the time when things are just sort of starting up and like a, a you know, a, a, a an idea that's looking for product market fit and the, the time they would get to Endeavor. So that's, that's on one side. But I think to your question about um, how do you, how do you, if, if there's been something that's already started in another country, right, how do you do it and not feel a copycat? That's what I was saying is I, I, don't, I don't love that terminology because I think that, for example, Kareem that I've mentioned, which is the Uber of the Middle East. Uber was in the Middle East, but here's the thing. Uber drivers were used to credit cards. Well, guess what? Until recently, until the last five years, there wasn't credit card penetration in, it was cash on, on, on demand. So now you had to figure out how to trust drivers with cash. They were getting cash. And, and so they had to figure out a driver rating system to make sure that they weren't getting ripped off. Oh, what, what does Uber have? We have GPS going addresses. Guess what? Saudi Arabia, no addresses. <laughs> so I think that this idea, and that's, by the way, why is Mercado Libre a $90 billion company, highest valued com company in Latin America? First, it beat out e e e eBay, then Amazon, then Alibaba. Why? Well, starting with eBay, eBay assumed, oh, everyone goes and, and uh, delivers the, uh, the good via UPS or FedEx, and somebody sends the, the, you know, the, the, the check or wires the money, no problem. Guess what? No one in Latin America was going to trust the mail post delivery systems. They would have to meet in the cafes with the cashier's check and with the whatever they were buying to see it. So I think sometimes this is why a lot of the big companies actually don't adapt well to, to other markets and why even if it's been there, done that, you need, there's an innovative way that the business model is applied. That's what we've seen again and again. Yeah, but good question. So in Asia, maybe more than other parts of the world, there's a sense of shame and failure, but failure is inherent in entrepreneurship. Yeah. So how do you overcome those kinds of cultural barriers and encourage entrepreneurs to start and start again? I, I, I love that. And one of the things we've done is have people who have, uh, who have failed talk more openly. I think it's got to, um, as someone said, it's not really celebrated in Silicon Valley. I think that goes too far, but certainly 
uh, people are not penalized. I, I read the, yesterday or today, someone sent me, someone from here sent me a story that Adam Newman of WeWork, one of the most spectacular epic failures, is going to buy WeWork out of bankruptcy. He's going to do, and he's getting backers to, <laughs> to invest in him again. It's like, wow, that is the second chance of all second chances. <laughs> and, but I think that there's something to that. And we've, we've worked with a lot of founders who've been kicked out of their CEO position and to help them become the angel investors, to help mentor the next entrepreneurs, to do it again, to, um, that it shouldn't be a sign of shame, that it's hard. Part of entrepreneurship is failure. Um, even the venture capitalists are betting that only one in 10 of the companies will succeed. What are you gonna do with the other nine? This is where sometimes the best founders are the ones who've had the experience and done things wrong and learned again. So I think the more we can show, I think this is why while this is a scary period, especially after we had that wave of everything going, you know, and getting people getting hundreds of millions of dollars in, in 2021. I think we're gonna look back at this period is when not only did the ship kind of write, but this is when the, the, the new generation, the new stories are told, and when some of the people that didn't succeed, you know, they, they, they left seeds that were really positive, and they left people with this training. It's not about the, the jobs that are being lost now. It's about the, the, the learning that's been going on. So, um, wonderful question. Let's come back in five years, but what we're gonna try to do as Endeavor is talk openly about um, failure and mistakes and how you move forward from there. All right, one last one, then we'll go. Um, no, we're done. I think we're done. Well, I have to say, it's wonderful to have you here. And this has been a very special week at Yale NUS. Every year we have, uh, we have a week which we call Diversity Week that we have a lot of events and programs um, that celebrate all of, the, all of the diversity that we have here on campus. And, you know, and having you here, um, an inspiring uh, woman who's worked in this kind of areas where we don't often see women um, in finance and technology, looking at that PayPal, maf pay PayPal mafia, and then the beautiful pictures of all the Southeast oh. Asian um, founders, it just feels like it's perfectly of the theme. You know, there's so much to celebrate, and I feel like you visiting us today is, is a gift, and, and you've paid it forward with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.